Uh, thank you very much, Colin, uh, for the introduction and, and Selena for helping with the organization and so on. And I also want to thank John Martin, who uh, also um, was involved in, in uh, thinking about this talk. And uh, I, I last, well, perhaps maybe the only time I've seen John Martin in person, I don't know, but was uh, after I gave a talk a few years ago when the days when we used to have in-person talks to the society. And he asked me afterward if there were, were any apps or websites sites where you could upload you know photos he had a ton of photos where you could upload your photos of wildlife and it might be of some value and uh to other people and uh, i said oh have i got a have i got a platform for you so it's kind of funny that we've come full circle years later <laughs> i don't know if john regrets all that information or not he's no okay he's, he's shaking his head um so here we are so that's i appreciate the opportunity to talk to you as uh, both a keen birder and a, and a naturalist so I'm going to do a little dance with the sh screen shares here, and I will hope that uh, this all comes through. Um, Selena, thumbs up on the full screen. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna call it. I'm calling it. I naturalist and eBird and you, and and uh, I'm going to give a. Uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about iNaturalist, and you can decide whether it's something you are interested in or not. I'll mention eBird more briefly, more as a comparison, in part because a lot of birders are already quite familiar with it. I realize many people listening in uh, may not be, but anyway, I'll mention that briefly. And basically, the umbrella here is, you know, community science generally, and how that um, uh, can be helpful for conservation, and also whether it can be fun for naturalists, especially uh, in this case, birders. So community science, we also call it citizen science. Uh, I tend to call it community science more often now, is simply a, a term for people collecting information that's useful for scientific research. And birders know all about this through Christmas bird counts, which are over 100 years old now eBird, I a naturalist, I'm going to chat about eButterfly, Frog Watch. There are hundreds and hundreds of online platforms where people can upload um, photos or just lists of what they've seen. And this is can be collated by um, people uh, who want to use that information for scientific research. <clears throat> and why I naturalist specifically? Well, um, let me, here's the growth of iNaturalist over the last six years. It started earlier than this, but it really went from zero to 60, um, literally, million observations in a very short period of time. You can see an exponential rate of uh, growth here, and uh, it's really been uh, quite a spectacular rate of growth. And I want to you to keep this number, 60 million observations, in mind. So that's the number of observations the platform had as of the end of 2021. So the start of this year, there were um, 60 million observations. Let's see. Oops. And here's what an observation is. I'll come circle back to this in a moment. But the, the unit here of an observation is, is basically a photo or an audio. It really is photo and audio driven. It's um, um, people don't generally say they saw something if they don't have a photo. It's really about photos and, and audios. So here's one I did a, f a few days ago of um, cackling geese in the, um, the playing fields beside uh, Burnaby Lake, which is a good spot to see a lot of these birds. And so it's a photo. In fact, I've uploaded three photos and an audio. That symbol, um, can you see my cursor, Selena? Yeah, okay. So that symbol means there's also an audio. I taped them on my on my phone. And you can see that it says when I observed it and what time and it's mapped uh, to the spot. And then other people can, anybody can see this photo and then they can comment on it. So they could say, um, actually, I think those are Canada geese. Um, fortunately, they didn't. The people have agreed with me. Um, and then, uh, and the result of them agreeing with me is that this photo uh, has this green banner, meaning that it's research grade or, or verified. At least two people agree. Uh, with what I saw. So that's sort of the unit of, of what um, you get when, when I say an observation in iNaturalist. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to jump. Has that worked, Selena? Can you see the map now? Terrific. Okay. Uh, takes a certain amount of bravery to jump back and forth wait, like wait, this. Wait, sorry, no. 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 I just see okay. the map. I will, that's no problem. I will change 
How about now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good. I'll have to keep getting your help because I can't tell what you see. So this is the website. Now I'm live on the website. I'm on iNaturalist. I'm off PowerPoint for a minute. And this is their sort of homepage. And the, the red squares have had at least one observation in them. And uh, remember we said 60, 60 million observations as of the start of this year. Look at the number now. Can you see my cursor, Selena? 120. It's doubled this year. It's doubled from all time. It's more. It's doubled, and four hundred and one uh, species, thousand species. Uh, Two hundred and seventy-eight thousand people have looked at photos and uh, confirmed or, or disagreed with what people thought they were. So they've identified other people's photos, and we are uh, now the iNaturalist is up to two point four million observers. So it's the world's largest community science platform. It has more observers in it, more people using it than eBird. Um, doesn't have more data points than eBird, but it certainly is, uh, it is the global, it's, it's, it's the one that, that so many people are going to. And the fact that it's doubled its observations in one year uh, kind of attests to the fact that this, the, this site is really taking off. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through some of the key pages that you can explore using iNaturalist, and then I'll do a, a demonstration of how to upload observations. And this will circle back to what Colin and I were just chatting about at the start here of, you know, how do you make this easy? How do you, what's the simplest workflow? I'll, I'll show you how I do it. So if you look at the top of the page of iNaturalist, oh, I should have said, by the way, it is of course a free website and, um, and it's run by the California Academy of Sciences in partnership with National Geographic Society. Um, and uh, so they're, they're doing this and anybody can use it. There's no charge for anything and you can, anybody can download data from it and use it for scientific or any other purpose. So it's wide open, totally open platform sharing. So explore, I'm gonna talk about explore here. And um, this is where I'm gonna to wanna to put Selena on the spot for a second. I warned her I would do this, but she didn't know I was gonna ask her. If you would like to unmute Selena, I'm gonna ask you to name any species of plant or animal, just anyone from anywhere in the world, just name a species for me. For plant or animal? Either one. Banyan Anything. trees. Pardon? Banyan trees. Banyan trees, okay. Of course, I am the world authority on banyan trees. Banyan, I don't even know how to spell it. B-A-N. How's that? Indian banyan, would you accept yes. that? Sure. Okay, so there's, I'm, I'm typing Indian banyan tree, and here are the um, observations of that tree around the world. So it looks like it's obviously been planted a lot, if, if the name is correct, uh, makes sense. It's been, looks like it's probably been planted here and there. But here are the observations that in the world. So there are 1,600 um, observations of an Indian banyan tree by 163, um, 1,163 observers. And I, so this is the map view, okay? This is where they are, where it's found. I can go to the grid and see the photos. So here they are. Okay. So these are the photos that people have been uploading of that particular banyan. I see it's a ficus. Many of you will know that it's a species of ficus like rubber plants. And, uh, and so if you wanted to, you could zoom in on it. So let's see, since it's called Indian uh, banyan tree, I can't resist going to India. There they are. These are the observations from India. And if I look at the map, Oh yeah. Okay. There you go. So that's clearly, I guess that's where it came from originally and it's been planted elsewhere, but you can see there's a lot of observations. In fact, people in India are really into iNaturalist. India has a really, um, um, there's a lot of observations from India of all kinds of species. So you get the idea here. You can, you can look at a species that could be from anywhere in the world. Uh, I could, I could have, instead of saying India, I could have written, you know, I could write Greater Vancouver. I don't think we've got any, um, presumably. But you know, it, for so we don't have it. But there it is. It's that fast to look at Vancouver if you wanted to, or British Columbia, or anything. And I could look at within certain dates. Well, how many have been seen this year or last year? Um, basically, you can do just about anything you can think of. Uh, it will give you all of this information in packaged in whatever form you want.
So that that's the Explore button. That's how you can just sort of see what's where, something you want to learn about, see photos of it, look at verified photos so that you know it's correctly identified. Okay, so now let's go to your observations. That is exactly what it sounds like. This is your, these are your lists, your observations, everything that you've uploaded to iNaturalist will appear here. So there's my map view. These are observations I have made. Um, and uh, so you can see I've been somewhat active on this particular site. 4,375 people in total have chimed in on my observations and helped with the IDs. And uh, I can go to a grid view. So these are in order of when they were most recently uploaded. So these were from yesterday in um, the lower um, Lynn Valley Conservation Reserve. Uh, you could do it as a list. Here's the list of all of them. And it says when I saw it, where it was, and when I uploaded it. And if I want to, I can, uh, I can click on any of these. There's the observation. So... This was a moss, um, and I happened to be with one of Western Canada's top bryologists at the time, Randall Mindel. And uh, so I put multiple photos in to give people the best chance possible of knowing what it is. And Randall Mind Mindel, who calls himself Ram Bryam, Bryam is a genus of mosses, agreed with me nine hours ago. So he saw that observation, he agreed, and so then it is research grade, meaning that it, it has everything it needs for people to, if they want to use it for research. One of the things I like it for, this for, is to jog my memory if I can't remember things that I've seen. So, um, it, it, you know, if you, when springtime comes and you want to remember, oh, where did I see that butterfly? I remember this, this there it is again, what is it? So you could type um, butterflies, um there i could say well i remember it was in greater vancouver so you can do that and then i've apparently seen 27 species of butterfly here they are ordered by how often i've seen them so 23 cabbage whites you all know that one and then here are things that i've only ever seen once like uh, this was at colony farm i remember that a western um, arctic skipper it's not a rare butterfly i just haven't apparently seen it very often. So then you can look at your this thing and you can remember, oh yeah, that's the that's how you tell pale swallowtail from an anis swallowtail. It might be something you've learned the previous year, but you forget over the winter. So it's just a nice way if you want to learn um, learn species. And of course, since I guess it's birders night, I, I guess I should be looking at birds. But you get the idea. I'm still in my observations. And so I've seen I guess I've photographed 269 species in Greater Vancouver, um, or have audios. Some of these will be audios, not not photos, or both. Okay, so that's all it is. That's your observations. The last tab I want to show you before we do an upload is community. So now I'm going to go to projects. So community projects. If you are into eBird, a project is like a hotspot. It's a location. Usually, it doesn't have to be. A project could also be based on the species. It could be the caterpillars of North America. It could be, you know, whatever people have created. Anybody can create these projects. Um, most of them are area-based. So let's go to Colony Farm. It auto-filled it because I was there not too long ago. So Colony Farm, go. There it is. And here's a project for Colony Farm. And those are observations in Colony Farm. Um, I created this project. I created projects actually for all of the metro regional parks. Um, I created this back in the day. But the thing about this is that if your photo will appear there automatically if the location is in Colony Farm. You don't have to know about the project. You don't have to join it. You have to do anything. It captures these things automatically. And if you zoom in, you can see this kind of, there's the dike system. The project, the photos that are not on the dikes are probably birds that were flying over that people moved into the right locations. And I'm going to click on a random point. I hope it's not one of mine. I have no idea. Let's just do this one. So they're color coded, whether it's a vertebrate or a plant or what it's this one. Good. That's not me. Okay. So let's view it. I don't know this thing. It's a beetle. Oh, that's neat. Um, somebody actually stuck a scale. 
from my personal collection collected from Muddy River Bank. I'll bet, uh, and there it is. And uh, nobody has been brave enough to agree with this. Okay, the person thinks they know what it is. And if you want to know what this thing it looks like, I can click on it and go. To, it has a home page, right? Every species has a home. There's its home page. There's where it's found. If it's true, it's a recent introduction to um, Western North America. I'd be very caught. No wonder nobody agreed yet. I'd be very cautious about this because uh, it's it's a rare beetle anywhere, and uh, you kind of have to really wonder if it's uh, if it's on this side of the continent. So, could be quite significant. Maybe it's a new introduction, um, or maybe not. But anyway, that was just its home page, and this person's just kind of left it sitting there, and and we'll see. Eventually, somebody will identify it. So back to that project. There we go. Uh, I'll zoom back out. And projects have leaderboards, so you can see who's seen the most species and observations. You may not be surprised about who that is, since it's not very far from my house. And uh, look, there's North Van Dad. That's <laughs> And that's John. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so North Van Dad has been active, John Martin been active in Colleen Farm and so on. If you want to, you can look at some statistics. What, what exactly are people finding there? Um, so what is it? 50% of the observations are plants. What's this? 38 species of fungi. Birds, 130 species of birds have been uploaded. Insects, 129 species. What are some of these tiny ones here? Arachnids, spiders, 12, 12 species, seven amphibian species, and so on. So these are accumulating, and um, you can see, um, you can watch things appear, and you can read about the place in the blurb and, uh, and so on. So that's a project. A project is a really fun thing to do because you can go to it. You can say, oh, what have people been seeing? What's new there? Um, have I got a new species for the park? Um, and, uh, and of course, you can imagine where this is going. The park people don't have the biological staff there to do these kinds of inventories, but they are getting 6,389 observations from other people of 724 species. And if there are rare species in there, um, now we have a way of knowing. Okay, so that's a project. There's one other kind of project I want to tell you about that which is an umbrella project. So if I go now, I'm going to go to BC Parks. I was there recently called BC Parks. This is an umbrella project. What that means is that it is an umbrella for many, many other projects within it. This is one that um, uh, a program that Brian Starzomsky from the University of Victoria and I are co-leading. It's in its fourth year now. It's the BC Parks iNaturalist program. We've been funded by BC Parks to create a project for every single park in the province. That's over 1,000 projects we made. And then we hire the best of the best young naturalists each summer to go and camp their way across the province and uh, upload hundreds of observations a day from each of the parks. So here's the leaderboard, Strathcona, way out front. There's some very keen um, naturalists in the area. That's by observations. If I look at species, it's still way ahead. Um, and then next is the South, so the South Okanagan, um, Hakai, and the Central Coast, and so on. I could literally, there's, I could keep going. There's like a thousand of these, a thousand and fifty-five, I think. But six hundred and fifty-two thousand observations, uh, and BC Parks is funding this because this is the, the, the sheer person power behind all of this is just way beyond anything that you could imagine biologists being able to do on their own. So that's an umbrella project. Most projects are just single places and you go community projects and you find them. I'm going to pause for a second, Selena, uh, and before I do an upload. But if anybody has any quick questions, I, I could give people a second to jump in. How are we doing? I don't see any in the chat but i think i need to unmute people so they can say something okay how do i unmute so what's so different about street corner uh well partly that it has a huge diversity of habitats from high high alpine to 
uh, quite low. But the biggest thing is that there is a Strathcona Wilderness Institute. Um, uh, these are people largely in the Comox Valley who have adopted Strathcona, and they've been hiring, they've been getting funding and hiring people, young students, to go in and uh, do the same thing that um, that we've been doing in other BC parks. So they're really high, they're just showcasing Strathcona, and these people go out and get hundreds of observations a day. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it is. They do have a, it's a big park, and it's got lots of diverse habitats. That certainly helps, but it's also just it only takes a few really keen activists to decide they want to put something on the map, and they can do it. Can you check species? Like, are they also vegan? Yeah, they're here. Are the species totals: the two thousand oh, wow. one ninety-five. Um, it's really impressive. Like, because look at Manning below there. Yeah. You no, know, Manning, I'm sure, gets far, far more visitors than Strathcona. In fact, it used to be number one, but um, they're smoking Manning. Um, but you know, <laughs> if I click on Manning, here it is. That's a photo I took. This is I created this project. There's the uh, people may recognize the Heather Trail. It's still got 18,000 observations. And um, there's the map. Lots of parts of Manning that have not been touched. Same with Strathcona, I'm sure. Okay, I have another question here from in sure. the text. John asks Can anyone create a project? Yes. And they're very easy to, to create. You just have to, um, you can draw a map and upload that as your location. And then uh, you, you do what I did here. You stick a nice banner photo in. I made this, uh, that's my, uh, that's a photo um, from some, uh, well, a friend of mine took the photo actually, I was there. Uh, you stick a banner photo in, you write a little blurb, you stick in a logo, we use the BC Parks logo, and uh, you're off and running. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, also, just because, before, before we go any further, I was just wondering if the participants can see well, because if you can't, you can go to the view options and you can, there's a zoom ratio, you can click into like a higher percentage so that it's easier on your eyes, so you're not squinting. Um, there's a question from Sean. What are the color coding representing on the umbrella BC parks? I think nothing. I think they're just trying to make them look different from one another. I can do a view more here and we'll see. Yeah, they're just working through the color palette, um, but they don't actually mean anything. I think they're just trying to make them look uh, look more attractive. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and Jay asked, who took the photos shown for a species? Uh, those are taken from some of the best photos that it were uploaded in the early days of whenever a species first appeared on iNaturalist. So the if you go to the home page, of a um, of a species, so let's go to um, a robin. Here's the home page. So these are good photos, and and they're they're from observations. So if I go to this one, Judy Gallagher, this would be an observation of hers from and and. Uh, and the curators in iNaturalist chose her photo. And they here's a selection of them. Here's a one in the, a bird in the winter when they get that kind of frosty plumage. And you know, it's just a representative set of photos um, that people have chosen. Mm -hmm. The the curators, the people who are really they, those are also citizen science, community scientists. Um, but these are people who've decided to take a real interest in the species. Great. And I have a question. Like, mm -hmm. can you view it by date by month I can see yep. kind of the you can there so let's go back to robins or let's go to something else how about uh bittern why not so and let's go to greater vancouver 74 observations of bitterns and filter see filter on the right top filter can you see my cursor filter and here are the dates i could do it on an exact date or i could do it on oops uh, or i could do a range of dates i could do this year right i can choose um, from january 1st to now and there have been 19 observations have been made in vancouver of american bittern this year 
Okay. And there they are. Most of those look like Colony Farm, I'm guessing. I know mine are. <laughs> we had a very cooperative bittern in Colony Farm this summer, eating invasive uh, weather loaches. Uh, thank you. So here's mm -hmm. another question from John. Does mm -hmm. iNaturalist deal with rare species differently from non-rare ones? Do you have to know the status of a species? That's a good question, John. Uh, you do not need to know the status. You can just upload it and say what you think it is. If it is a species that is vulnerable to uh, poaching or persecution, then iNaturalist automatically obscures its location so people can't track it down from the map. So the, the true look coordinates are available to um, people in the Provincial Conservation Data Center, which keeps track of rare species, but members of the public cannot see it. So, um, so you don't have to protect it, um, but iNaturalist will. So I'm trying to think of an example. I won't bother with this, but, um, and you don't have to know its status. Uh, you just can upload it, and then iNaturalist, I, iNaturalist knows to some extent what the status of a species is. Um, the, it's, it's, it's based on provincial and federal status, so it'll tell you, but it's a, it's a bit wonky and a bit out of date, and I don't really use it for my research. But if you go to American Bitter, and it says here, it's vulnerable. Okay, vulnerable. And if I click on that, that's within British Columbia, it has a status of vulnerable, but I'm not sure that's, I'm just saying that may not be true uh, because th this, uh, this part of the, the data set is always out of date, so I don't know. But you can even filter by whether something's threatened. Um, but as I said, I take those with a grain of salt. I think it brings up Rufus Hummingbird and double-crested cormorant. So uh, something's a bit off about what they think is threatened. Hmm. Any other questions, Selena, or do you want to, should we do an upload? Yeah, I think so. Okay, this, this will be, the, no problem, this will be the scariest part of the presentation. We'll see what happens. On every page, no matter where you are, there's a button for upload. It's in the top right of the screen. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I'm just going to hit it. Okay, so I can drag and drop photos. Now... Now I have to find my photos. Hang on. This is just that I see a lot of screens at once and things are over top of each other. I have found it. Um, you probably can't, you're not going to see this, I think, for a moment. But what I'm doing is I went to some photos that I took this, mor took this afternoon in Colony Farm. I've gone to a folder where they're ready to go on my laptop and I'm going to drag and drop them on. So there they are. I'm uploading a large number of photos at once. I just dragged and dropped from my laptop. Okay, this is a, this is the most important part of my talk, actually, folks, because I think this is the point where you decide whether you think this thing is worthwhile or not. Because if it isn't this easy, then you may not want to be bothered with it. But literally, all I did is I took my photos, which I had taken today um, with my big camera, my big, uh, but I could have done it with my phone photos, and I just put them on my laptop and now I've dragged and dropped them. Now, I if you take them photos with your phone, if you use your phone just as a camera, forget the app, is what I do, I ignore the app. Use your camera, if you use this telecommunications device as a camera, then as long as your, notif your uh, location services are turned on, when you put the photo onto that page of drag and drop, the location will go with it. Because your phone has a GPS and the and it so the the photo takes the location with it and you don't have to manually map it, okay? If if you use a big camera that doesn't have a GPS, there are apps that you can have on your phone that will automatically put a GPS location onto your camera. I use one of those, so I did that. That and it it so the phone talked to my photos and it it stuck a location on each one because it knew where I was at the moment that I took the photo, right? So let's see, what have we got? First of all, you'll notice, um, I, I'm going to start on the top left here uh, with one of my worst photos of the day. It knows the date and it knows the time. So at 1.22 p.m. today, I took this photo. And if I click on the location, 
You'll notice these have all got locations on them. There's where I went. There's where I took my photos today in Colony Farm. Okay. I went out after lunch. So it's mapped them automatically. If you don't have a if it's not if you don't have a location tagged onto your photo, you can map it manually. It's not that it's not hard. So if you have an old slides that you want to digitize, you can stick them on here and you can just manually map them as long as you know the date. Okay? So we'll get out of that. So it knows where I was and when I was. Now, what about the look? What is this thing? Okay, I'm going to put Colin on the spot. I can't resist. Colin, I can see your face. Do you want to take a crack at, the, at one of the worst photos of the day? I do agree. Okay, it's a pied bill <laughs> grebe. <laughs> it is indeed a pied bill grebe. I, I have many excuses. It was, um, it was raining, and this bird I saw it. Uh, <laughs> I saw it in a slough. I took one quick photo. It dove, and I waited two minutes in the rain, and it never reappeared. So this is all I got. Okay, now, what is it? I'm going to ask iNaturalist what it thinks it is. So you see, the species name is blank. I am going to tap. I'm going to tap on this spot. I hope you can see the cursor. I'm going to tap on it and ask iNaturalist if it knows what it is. So let's tap on it. Loading suggestions. It says, we're not confident enough to make a recommendation, but here are our top suggestions. And the top suggestion is pied bill grebe. Okay? Partly because they've been seen nearby. How it came up with black duck, I have no idea, because they most assuredly have not been seen accurately nearby. So it doesn't know it's a terrible photo, but it says, so you got to be careful. But as Colin and I, and many of you know, it is a pied bill grebe. So I'm just going to tap on that and we've got it. Okay. So I notice I'm not having to type anything here. Right. And I'm taking forever to do this because I'm taking you by the hand. But honestly, I could do 50 of these in two minutes. Okay. Let's look at the next one. This is a, yeah, the photos are really very distant. I think most of you will recognize this is a northern shrike. First one I've seen this winter. This is, um, let's try it. What do you think it is, iNaturalist? We're not confident, but it might be a northern shrike. Okay, cool. Um, it got it. I mean, that's not bad, considering how terrible that photo is. It flew nearer to me, and I had to crop it pretty heavily. You can see the rain coming down. If we ask it now, it's pretty sure it's a shrike. See that? That's change. We're pretty sure it's a shrike. And if it is a, and and especially we think it's a northern shrike. Do you want this is and this is funny. Its second choice is an eight-spotted skimmer dragonfly. Now let's suppose you think, oh, maybe it's a dragonfly. Okay. Let's view the dragonfly. So I'm moving the cursor to where it says view. You see why it went for that as its second choice? So the it, it uses artificial intelligence. Right? It trains itself on research-grade photos, and the pattern recognition softwares is seeing the same shades of gray and black that you get in a shrike. I think that's really cool. So my point here is these are suggestions. Right, You have to be careful, but we're taking the shrike. Now, um, I've got two photos of the same bird. I'm going to combine them. So I'll click on the, the lousy photo of a shrike, and I drag it underneath the other one, and now we have one observation with two photos. See that? That way people don't think I saw two shrikes. Okay? So I'll move a little more quickly now. Um, this is, uh, we know what this is. Ask I naturalist. Mm -hmm. Mallard, yes. Again, not a great shot. A blurry flying hoodie, merganser. Ask I naturalist. Nails it. And if it isn't that, maybe it's a buffalo head. That's a good second choice. Uh, okay, why do I show you these photos? It feels like the Burke Mountain Naturalist things where I, I have a contest to see who can identify my worst photos. So this is a, a common, a, 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 a merganser diving way in the distance on the main river. And uh, let's ask it. Let's try to stump the panel here. Not confident, maybe a loon, maybe a common merganser. And after that, it goes to Europe. Okay, terrible. Uh, if you ask it a better photo, it's not a good photo, but if you ask it that photo, common merganser, it got it. Okay, I'm so embarrassed about the second photo, I'm going to remove it. 
I'm gonna. I'm not gonna upload that to iNaturalist. Okay. Golden Crown Sparrow. Yes, and it says if it isn't that, maybe it's a white crowned, and if it isn't that, maybe it's white throated. So it's it knows it's in that genus. Um, whoops. A couple of hoodies. It knew it. I'll slide that together because it's one. Thing. Okay, uh, threw in a couple plants. So this is a broadleaf dock, common weed, uh, big broad base of the of the leaf where it joins the stem. Let's ask it. Yes, it gets broadleaf dock, and it's not. Oh, it is asking if it's not that. It's a different dock. Yes, it's a broadleaf dock. Now I zoomed in on, on the spots here because this is actually a type of um, of rust called red dock dock spot. Um, let's see if it can get it. It's pretty sure it's in the genus, and that is the correct genus for that thing. So if it's not that, it doesn't know what I'm trying to look at here. It's correct. It is, in fact, I'm going to type this red dock spot, which is in that genus. And then finally, um, a moss. This is a actually not a commonly photographed moss. I am pretty confident this is pointed spear moss. It says it's either that or something else. It, that's its second choice. I'm taking it. Let's try it again. Oh, now that's its first choice, but it's not sure. And with this terrible photo, could be anything. Um, yeah, that's the third choice. Okay, so I'm over. I'm I'm taking the one that I'm pretty sure it is. And and again, I will combine these because it's all three three views of the same plant. Uh, combine that. I think we're done. I'm hitting the submit button on the top right. I'm submitting 10 observations to iNaturalist. I guarantee you that within 10 minutes, the Shrike, the Hooded Merganser, the Golden Crown Sparrow will have been verified by somebody else. Okay. There they are. Now they're in my system. They, they exist as um, observations. And so you can, um, you can see them all there. They're in my list. And... Um, I can look at one, and there it is. Northern Shrike needs ID because nobody else has seen it yet, and it's mapped, and with the date and the time. And now anybody can see this observation and uh, make a suggestion about what it is. They can disagree with me, uh, and if they do, you, hopefully they will say why. And people are, tend to be extremely supportive on this uh, website. So before I leave uploads, um because we're kind of getting getting there um are there any any questions again i can't see the chat because i've got too many screens open but so then any any questions at all this is a good time because i think honestly folks i think this is probably the most personally i think this might be the most useful part of this talk because getting people over the hump for how to upload to iNaturalist is i think the most useful barrier that we can remove if you're interested in in all of this so at this point, no questions yet, but I have a question about the location ID. Yeah. So what if I go with a camera? How, like when I see these observations there, like longitude, latitude, I don't have that detail. Can I just describe a general area by name? Would that be good enough? Um, I don't know the Latin long either. Okay, so I have never ever put in any Latin long. Um, I naturalist knows the Latin long. So... It depends on how you do it. If you use the phone, location services turned on, it will automatically know where the photo was taken. Okay? If you use a camera, then you map it yourself. If it doesn't have, if you have not geotagged it using an app that talks to your camera. Okay? So when I go to the upload, when you go to that upload page, I won't do it, but I'll just give you a hint, I'll give you a, a sense of how you can do it. I can, um, yeah, I don't have any random photos to share with you, but I'm just going to take one of those again. I drag and drop it. Now, suppose it didn't know where I was. Then what I could do, see this, search for a location. Say I had no clue. I could type um, Port Coquitlam, okay? So it's somewhere in Port Coquitlam. You see the deal here? And then... I'm going to zoom in on Colony Farm because I know I was in Colony. See, I've zoomed in and now click and I've mapped it. Okay. Okay. 
So that's how you do it if you don't have a GPS tag on the photo. You map it yourself. And if I didn't remember where I was exactly, okay, but I remembered I was somewhere near the, uh, near the pond, okay, in Colony Farm, well, then I'll just enlarge this to show that it was somewhere around there, right? Or if it's an ancient photo that you dug out of, you know, that you digitized from a slide, uh, and I know it was in Colony Farm, but I don't remember where, well, you could just do this, okay? It's still helpful, still useful to people, and uh, now it means my accuracy, it says my accuracy is 661 meters, that would be fine, okay? okay. But, um, but I will tell you, um, if you like, uh, let me digress just for a minute, because I think this is actually perhaps useful for you to know. This is an app called, um, can you see that okay? Geotag Photos Pro 2. I could put that in the chat at the end. I'll, I'll put it in there. But it's Geotag um, Pro Photos 2. As soon as I start walking, I hit a start button. And every 15 seconds, it's recording where I am. And then it knows what time it is. And my camera knows what time it is. And then the app talks to my camera on my, on my photos on my laptop. And it goes shooting through them all and, and, and puts locations on them all. Mm -hmm. So it's automatic. That's why I got away with the upload I did from my, my big camera. Because it doesn't have a GPS, but the, it knew where to put them. It's because I used Geotag Pro Photos too. Okay. I'd say that's kind of next level, folks. I, I think if you're an, new to iNaturalist, you may not want to take on too many things at once and maybe do some manual uploads uh, unless you took the photo with something that has a GPS on it. But that's, that's, that's where I would go with this in the future. So when we're doing hundreds of observations a day as part of our BC Parks iNaturalist program, um, you know, we, we just tag them all that way automatically. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm um, glad you asked. That's important too. That's an important part of the learning curve to get over that. Mm -hmm. So John asks, is it important to try to add any annotations? Um, it helps. It can help. Um, so if it's a, um, let me um, remove this before I upload it twice. Uh, it helps. So if um, if it's a if it's a plant that's hard to identify, and I can probably find you an example um but if it's a plant that's hard to identify then putting down the habitat is good right so um if i um i can probably show you examples of annotations that's that's the short answer get lots of photos if you can and um let's see that one from yesterday okay i just i wrote down manually where i took it i didn't say what the habitat was but I certainly did for some of these because that was actually helpful for knowing what it is. So the, the short answer is yes. Um, this one, for example, American earwort, that species is found on rock. There's a lookalike that's only found on, uh, is on, um, on wood. And so um, I may have said on there that it's on rock. So yeah, I'd say it's helpful. Um, it, it can be very helpful for people to figure out what it is, especially if it's a plant. Um, otherwise, you can say anything you want with, with your annotation. So I don't know which of these have got annotations, but you can certainly say um, anything you want or how common it was or, or anything like that. So um, here we go. I said um, purplish underneath. Um, that was partly just to remind myself of that. So I actually put that in here. I wrote that it's purplish underneath. And then if I wanted to, if, if Randall... Mindel had said, hey, John, are you sure, you know, what was it growing on? I could leave him a comment and say um, it was growing on uh, rock. Okay. That's a, gr that's a great question. So my advice is for a lot of things, go ahead and take multiple angles and multiple photos. That really helps. Uh, and um, like here, you know, I had eight photos of this thing. See them all? These are all eight photos because... I hadn't seen it very often. I was kind of keen to see it. And uh, I had it top side, bottom side, every way I could to try to enhance the chances that somebody could um, help with that ID. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, I think you've kind of covered this, but here's a question. Yep. What considerations should a newbie have with regards to using iNaturalist? 
How can I avoid messing up? Ah, so I mess up all the time. Um, I get things wrong. Most of my greatest hits have been misidentifications or things where I didn't know what they were. So um, people will help you and, and there's no shame in that. And so if, if I, I wanted to show you something, if Randall Mindel, Ram Bryan said, uh, no, John, I think it's a different species of gyrothyra and here's why, I can go to this and I hope you can see my cursor. I'm going to where I wrote it in. And I can do withdraw. I can back off and let Randall's new identification stand, and I simply back out of it. Okay, um, so you can withdraw your uh, and then let somebody else's ID, you know, go. Um, if they give you a good reason and you can understand why exactly they said that, then you could just agree with them, right? So there's an agree option. He already agrees with me, so I, I did, don't have that option, I guess. But uh, if somebody disagrees with you, you could back off and actually go so far as to agree with them. I would only do that if you can see for yourself why it is definitely what the person said it is. But um, if you upload a fern from Pacific Spirit Park and somebody says, no, it's, it's, it's not a sword fern, it's, it's a bronze holly fern. You can tap on the person's profile. I can tap on Randall's name here. And if that comes up and they say, you know, I'm the curator of, of botany at the Burke Herbarium in Washington with a specialty in ferns, run, <laughs> run away, <laughs> withdraw, right? Withdraw because, you know, you've got, a, you've got an expert who's going to give you, who clearly knows what they're talking about. If I, if I don't know who this person is, He's, he's become a friend who we met through, through iNaturalist. His profile says, trying hard to learn and see all the mosses and liverworts in the Pacific Northwest. Also, intertidal invertebrates, lichens, and algae. So right away, you know, this is somebody probably knows what they're talking about. But there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Okay, it happens all the time. And, uh, and you can change your mind. And, uh, and, you know, people help. People are very helpful. And if you don't know what something is, you could write plant, right? You can back up. You could say insect because you don't know, right? Or beetle, right? So go to the level you're comfortable with. You can say bird. It's fine. Or goose, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. I think you've answered this question from Harvey, but um, Harvey, maybe you can pipe up. So the question is, are the geotagging apps provided by the camera manufacturer? Or is there a general app that works with many different cameras? Um, the answer is uh, the, no, the camera manufacturers do not provide them unless your camera has a built-in GPS. And there's been a trend toward fewer and fewer cameras having GPSs now. And I think it's because of, of the fact that you can do it so much more easily and quickly and accurately, I must say, using apps on your phone. So geotag, uh, I gotta get the right name of this. Let me just double check here. Um, <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure that's the correct name, but anyway, geotag pro photos too, um, which I will put in the, in the chat once I'm not full screen. That is the way to go. You have to pay for it. It's about 25 bucks. But um, if you're doing a lot of um, observations, I, I strongly recommend it. And so if I go to, Here's, here's today's track. There's where I went today in Colony Farm. See, and so it knew where I was going. And then when I hit stop, I, I, up, it, it talked to all of my photos on my laptop. So I won't show you how do you do that exactly, but it zipped through them right away. And then, uh, then I've got permanently tagged photos thanks to Geotag Pro Photos too. Yeah, that's cool. Um, actually, I bought a Panasonic uh, uh, point and shoot, uh, which has one of the ones with the, the high zoom. And mm. Panasonic did, in fact, provide a geotagging app with it, but it's very mm. clunky to use, which is why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah. I um, for my macro photos, I use a. I don't. I can see it, but I'm not going to get up to get it. I, I use a little 
little camera about this big, which is really good for macro. It has a GPS, but it's kind of unreliable and not very precise. So I don't bother with it. I just I override the locations by using my um, my phone app. That makes sense. Thank you. Great. You bet. Okay. Any other questions? Um, yes. Yes. And and I put down the geotag thing that the name according to what it shows on the app, so you don't have to do that after. Thank you. Um, yeah, David John. asks. Oh, to Colin. Yeah, John. I'm just wondering when I'm seeing these similarities between eBird, which I use as you know every time I go out. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any way to move your eBird observations into iNaturalist in a very easy mm -hmm. way, I mean. That, that may be something that's not possible, but it seems to me that it would be very, very handy to be able to take my observations, say at Colony Farm where I was yesterday and, and move those observations into iNaturalist. I agree, Colin, uh, and it would not be technically difficult. If iNaturalist and eBird, it's, you know, if their software engineers could probably solve, do that in a week, in a long weekend. Um, compared to the technical difficulty of what else they do within their own platforms. But right now, no, uh, that is not a thing. And I don't know if they've been having those discussions, um, but it would be very nice. And I've actually, I've got a couple of thoughts on this with slides, which I can get to just to wrap things up, if you like, Selena, which will actually address that head on. But it's a great, it is a great question. It's the whole question of should I use both or one, yeah. right? And I think a lot of people are wondering that. And I do have some thoughts on that that I can get to, um, I think, next. But. Okay, Just maybe two more questions. Sure, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Um, David asked, you mentioned initially that anybody can download at any photo. Does that mean that they're in public domain or is permission needed to use the photo with proper attribution? Another terrific question. You decide what level of uh, what level of um, copyright or attribution you want. So uh, on this photo here, there's a CC. That means it's a Creative Commons some rights reserved so that's a setting that i had in iNaturalist and i don't recall exactly how all of that works but if i go to the info this is the info it tells you look at that it tells you i used an olympus tg6 adobe and somewhere i think somewhere it will tell me what the restrictions are so um there it is here some rights reserved edit license there we go so there you go. It gives you advice on what your options are. Okay. So you can have it strictly look at attribution, non-commercial attribution, share alike. I don't know what all this means. I just decided early on that I didn't really want much of a copyright on it. If somebody thinks they can make money from my photos, um, they can knock themselves out. Uh, what I find though, is that in general, I, I often get you can direct message somebody through iNaturalist and I often get direct messages saying, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm writing a book. I'm doing this website. Can we use this photo with, and we'll of course give you credit. And I always say yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, one last question. How, sure. how about bird bands? Uh, what about bird bands? Or maybe John, you can, you can speak. Oh, yeah, sorry, I, 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 I was out of sequence there on my, on my two-part question. Uh, but if you see a, a, a bird that, that has a bird band on it, um, is it uh, important, relevant, or something that you should take note of? And, and, and how would you document that in iNaturalist? Well, you could certainly say in the comments that it has a band, and if it's if it's an alphanumeric, like, like <laughs> with, the, um, with the geese, for example, if it's one you can read, well, then that's another, I not probably won't help, but you can certainly, there are places to search and report it. I, I saw a cackling goose um, in Belcara Regional Park a number of years ago, where I was able to read the entire leg band, all of it. And uh, I found my way through, it wasn't really through INAT. I, I did INAT it, but eventually I found it and I got an answer and they told me where it was born and when it was born in Alaska and everything else. So I, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, if it's color banded, John, if it's color banded, Somebody will be interested, but I don't know how you get their attention. Um, yeah, hmm. yeah. I don't know how you okay. find out who color banded it, because then that means some researcher has got them individually marked for for some sort of a research project. I'm sure they'd be very interested, but I don't know how you'd find them. So, so if I just say it was banded on the left leg or right leg, and it was silver or white or whatever. 
that might be enough to get someone's attention. Well, it might okay. if they ha if they use eBird or iNAT. Um, but I okay. I think if I haven't tried this, but I suspect with some rummaging around on Google, um, you would could probably track down where you report these sorts of things. So if it has a if it's color banded, then the Canadian Wildlife Service has given a band or a permit to color band it. Right. So this this information and and the birders, well, in the days when I used to color band some birds, um, you reported your band combinations. I don't know if that still happens, but they might. It might be that CWS can can steer you to the right person who color banded it. That might be. So I think I'd go through CWS. Or you know, if it's in Colony Farm, then go and ask. You know the, the the banders in Colony Farm. You know, was this you or do you know who did it? I mean, half the half the chickadees and other birds and song sparrows anywhere near the banding station have got at least a silver band on them. But you can't read those usually. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to jump. Uh, lost track of where I am, but I'm going to try to jump back to um, PowerPoint because I think that's where I am. I think I need to hang on. Uh, okay, I'm lost. Selena, what are you seeing? Um, Full screen, screen or no? A screen that you don't want to show us. <laughs> okay, so you're seeing my speaker notes? Yes. Okay. Um, 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 hang on. I naturalist now. Yeah, I'll switch back. I just need to find my way back here. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, well, it's moved my screen sharing to a different place. Uh, new share. Uh, if I do that, am I full screen with PowerPoint in a second? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, can, okay. I'm going to just make yeah. sure I mute all and then, and then you can unmute again. Okay, cool. So wait, John, you have to unmute yourself though. All right, am I back? <laughs> I'm doing too many things at once here. So um, there you go. Okay, well, let's. I'm going to move a little faster. Um, I just want to say a few words about eBird because I use that every day, um, literally as well. And uh, and you know there. So you know there's what you see if you if you're going to use your phone. I do use my phone for eBird. Um, because you can start the checklist and it tracks where you go and records all that information automatically. Um, but, and if you use eBird, right, there's your checklist. So that's what it looks like. So compare that with iNaturalist. But here it's a checklist. It's not photo driven. That's the big difference. It's not photo driven. You can put a photo in if you know, if you had one, but otherwise you just say how many of each species you saw. But it's not photo driven. You can put an audio into. Now, I have a thought question for you. I want you to stop and think, everybody on this call, I want you to stop and guess how many checklists have been submitted to eBird today. Just have a number in your head. How many checklists today were submitted to eBird? Things people saw today. Okay, have you all got that number in your mind? You're too low. Can you see that? The do you see the website yet, Selena, or do I need to switch it? Yeah, please switch. No problem. Do you see it now? I see the map. Okay, and do you see the number, everybody, on the right hand side? Thirty-three thousand checklists have been submitted today to eBird, and watch those dots are where they've been submitted from. Watch for a, a yellow, little yellow explosion. There's one in the UK. See that? Right up. And uh, watch for another one. There's one in India. Oh, there's one in the Midwest of the US, et cetera. These are people hitting submit while I'm talking to you, right? Those are all, those, each of those is somebody had just submitted a, a checklist. You can see we're going to get to 34,000 before I'm finished with this slide. Now, I mean, this is just 
mind boggling how much data eBird is amassing, right? So I love iNaturalist, I love eBird. Scientifically, the brute force of the number of observations that are submitted to eBird is simply off the charts, right? If any of you weren't already sure, it just proves that birders are in fact uh, crazy. So um, here we go. So we're going to, yeah, I won't bother staying, but you can see we're going to break 3,400. And this is in real time. So it's counting down the time. It's in uh, as we go. So those are the checklists that have been submitted today to eBird. Okay, so I'm going to go back to PowerPoint. I can't believe I'm getting away with all these uh, switches here. Am I back to PowerPoint now? Okay. <laughs> I need to, uh, I need to quit while I'm ahead here. Um, Okay, I did, we did that. Okay, uh, let's just talk about what you get out of it. Okay, this is, um, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of anecdotes about conservation, then I'm out. Okay, um, for both platforms, you can get lists of taxa by area, date, etc. Okay, it's obviously only birds and eBird and it's anything else, but both can do all those things, no problem. With iNaturalist, you can share photos, audios with others, and it's optional in eBird. Okay. Um, you can upload a photo or not if you have one, but uh, you can do photos and that it's driven in iNat. You can get help from others with IDs in iNaturalist, and you cannot in eBird. If 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 you put in an an ostrich from Greater Vancouver, then uh, that would probably get noticed and flagged, and the overworked volunteer eBird regional editor will eventually if if she has time get in touch with you and say hey john i don't think you really saw an ostrich in greater vancouver and somebody else can notice it and flag it but there's no direct dialogue there's no direct it's it's a one-way street with ebird you put it in and you're done whereas with uh, inat there's a dialogue okay and you get positive feedback not really an ebird in my opinion positive feedback because people say hey great shot or Wow, that's cool. Are you sure it isn't a, a different kind of garter snake or, or whatever with iNAT? This is something eBird um, does not do. And, uh, and so it's a kind of a one-way street. Now, I've lost my cursor. There it is. And I just want to show you an example of that. Again, I can't believe how many times I'm switching um, photos here, but I think it's – hope this will be worth it um, – Am I back to Wright's Filmy Fern? Okay. So look at this thing. I photographed this this summer. I work in the Central Coast. That's my base for my research. I work up uh, out of Bella Bella. I study salmon and things like that. But we do a lot of um, research and there on other things. And so I uploaded this, and I said it's, it's a liverwort. Okay. I was with Randall Mindle, my friend, the biologist, and we both went, what the heck is this? It's, a, you know, it's clearly a liverwort. Right, undifferentiated, no central mid vein. It's not a moss, and it's got these weird finger-like projections. It's a tiny, tiny little liverwort, and I thought maybe Metzgeria. Okay, it was at a hot springs actually, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then Randall said, "Okay," he tags in an expert from Washington. Said this struckus is different. He describes how it was growing. John's photos suggest it might be a different liverwort never seen one like it he's looked at the books he just can't get it and david says hey it's Wright's filmy fern it's not a liverwort at all it's a fern i recognize this from having been taken to a population in southeast ask alaska great find with two exclamation marks these are great pictures showing filamentous um uh, asexual reproductive buds and randall says wow thanks and um and uh, complete surprise i chimed in Steve Ansel, some of you know him as a birder. He's one of the West Coast's um, foremost experts on ferns, said, cool. I mean, you just don't get this with eBird. There is no mechanism for it. There's no plot. You can't talk to people on eBird, right? So we made this really good discovery of a super rare fern and excited some professionals and some of the top amateurs in the field. You know, stick, stick your bird in eBird and it's like sits there. You don't, there is no mechanism for um for that kind of feedback so and feedback is nearly always um very positive in my experience with this platform so i think i'm back on powerpoint 
I think we're pretty much done. What scientists get out of it, I won't go into. I just want to give you a quick, I'm going to skip, I'm going to move right to the point. I was the chair of CASIWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife, until recently for a four-year term. It's an independent body of scientists that decide what the status is, and then the government decides whether to protect them, okay, under the Species at Risk Act. And um, so there's about 105 scientists that I was leading in this organization who volunteer their time, okay? Um, there's what a meeting looks like when we decide the status of a species. And um, it's a big group to chair. I had to do it over Zoom for the past, we meet twice a year. I had to do it over Zoom, uh, which was really interesting. Try chairing a meeting with that many scientists and observers, uh, that was fun. Um, and there's, a, you know, we see lots of species. But let's talk about community science. Okay, let's, here are the percent of, of, of our status reports that have community science in it. And you can see that it's a lot higher um, now than it used to be. So in the most recent three or four year period, it's about 35% of their status reports have community science of some kind. And it was a lot lower 10 years earlier. And almost all of this growth is accounted for by iNaturalist and eBird. So if you photograph a rare something and put it in iNaturalist, or if it's a bird, you can also stick it in eBird, scientists who decide what the status of a species is will notice and it will help inform us in whether something is truly rare. And let me give you an example. Here's a beautiful dragonfly. This is my photo from the cover of, a, of the document. It's a grapple tail. It's found in about seven sites in uh, the lower Fraser Valley. And uh, Kosiewicz said it was special concern, almost threatened, not quite. Um, how do we know? Well, <laughs> there was an observation in an iNaturalist uh, which got me thinking, uh, and there you can see it's north of um, north of Mission. I said, okay, let's get a group together and we'll go look for this darn thing. And so I invited some people over. Jeremy Gatton is in the photo on the right over there. That's the person whose original photo. He came over from the island. This is Jennifer Heron, the Provincial Invertebrate Specialist from BC Parks. We went to a site where they would have been seen 40 years ago and not since, and we found a bunch of them. And here we've discovered a new one. So, so Jeremy and I on the right-hand side are both photographing another grapple tail. And sure enough, now with INAT, we've got lots of grapple tails. Various experts on dragonflies are going to these sites. They're looking for them. We discovered a lot more than we ever knew before. And that's how Kasiwik was informed that this thing um, is a special concern that's in some protected areas. It's probably not quite at risk of extinction. I'm going to skip this one um, just because I feel like with the questions and stuff, we've kind of moved on. Um, should you use iNaturalist? You know, there's no right answer to this. Only if you think it's fun is my short answer. Okay. Only if you're enjoying it. Um, you know, it's quick to do the uploads. If you're going to process your photos for, for eBird, I mean, why not stick them into iNat? It's very fast. Um, you can make lots of discoveries, uh, rare species and so on. And uh, certainly if you want to learn some new species, of course, that's great for that. If you only only care about birds, I'm not sure it's worthwhile, really. Uh, maybe just stick with, with eBird. Um, but as I mentioned, there's the positive feedback factor. So really the key is it has to be fun. If, if it's not fun, then uh, yeah, why do it? So if, if it's a burden for you, then, you know, don't bother. But if, for me, it's something I do, you know, when I'm watching a hockey game and, you know, I'll have my laptop open, I'll stick photos up on iNaturalist to rummage around. It works for me. It's not necessarily for everyone. Um, but I hope that you might be interested in giving it a try. And with that, I am out of here. Back to you, Selena. Oh, that is amazing. I'm going to ask the audience to just unmute and ask questions. Ask it away. Yep. Happy to answer questions. I just didn't want to push you too late. So happy to have questions. John. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed that you did not talk about SEEK. And, and the reason I bring it up is that I've actually been out uh, and I just led a, 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 a walk in Pacific Spirit Park just a, a couple of weeks ago and everyone had their, their phones with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the only one that had a phone and a camera. Mm -hmm. but, so I put my camera mm -hmm. away and I, just, and I used my phone, but we were using Seek. Um, can you just cover that a little bit? Because one of the things I found was that there was a lot of confusion about, about 
the term I naturalist, they were using it, they were conflating it with Sikh and that was sort of partially correct, but they were very confused. And so I, I had to spend a lot of time talking about Sikh versus I, the true I naturalist. Mm -hmm. And then of course I confused them when I said, well, there's an I naturalist app for your phone too. And then but it took a little while to kind of go over all that. Yeah. Uh, but I just found it interesting that there were so many people that were very interested in just using their phones. And, yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it is confusing. Um, but Seek, in a nutshell, Seek was identified by, was, was um, invented by the people who are behind iNaturalist. So it's the same group mm -hmm. of people. And it was intended as a sort of instantaneous photo recognition um, mechanism that would appeal more to younger people and and so with seek folks you you um, start the app and then um, so this is seek with seek you start the app and then you take a photo uh, or you don't have to take a photo you just hold it up in front of something and it will suggest what it what it thinks it's seeing I don't know if it's going to identify snow goose from the, your photo there, but it's it's literally <laughs> it's quite good that way. And so it's like having a little field guide in your pocket. You just scan it onto the plant or whatever it is, and it will suggest what it is. If you agree with it, you can say, "Yeah, that's it," and then it'll upload to iNAT if you want to. That, in a nutshell, that's all it is. It's I use it occasionally if. If it's driving me crazy that I'm in the field and I can't remember what a thing is, you know, it's like, so I was in Ontario um, this summer and I, I'm from Ontario originally and I saw all these plants and it was just driving me nuts. I was eye natting, I was taking photos of them, but I just had to know what they were and I use Seek. So it's really that simple. I, you know, you can use Seek and you, it does go to, you can send it to iNaturalist if you want to, um, but it's not, I don't use it much myself. Does that does that help? Yeah, I, I just said I, I think and, and when I look at some of the stats for, for iNaturalist, I, I see it's it's almost a 50-50 split between people using smartphones that, that upload their photos. And mm -hmm. so there's quite a few out there that, that naturally use their phones. And and if we're to kind of try to encourage, I, I'm all about trying to encourage more and more people to just get yeah. out there and make observations and, you know, use a camera, use a phone, whatever, yeah. uh, just get out there and enjoy it and connect. Um, but it's very, very popular. And, and I mm -hmm. find that Seek was a good, uh, a good extension. Um, but because, because everything stays on your phone with Seek, uh, yes. unless you download the, the That's actual right. INAP uh, application. And then you can do an upload, mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty cool. I, you know, you show people the six dots and how it kind of zooms in from the kingdom level all the way down. And it, 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 it I, it, and by the way, the people that I was out with, um, I was probably one of the younger ones. So, so there's there there is a cohort out there of older people that are using phones, yeah, yeah. Uh, or very interested in using phones, which I find very exciting because you know they, they're out there and doing it. So. Um, it's uh, yeah. it, it's just I just wanted to, to kind of poke you a little bit about Seek because uh, I think it's uh, quite a useful kind of extension to the iNaturalist platform. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought it up. And and uh, when I give talks on this, people uh, often do, and I usually um, forget to mention it. So I'm glad you did. Um, yeah, yeah. If if working, you do whatever is fun for you. I mean, if if you like <laughs> using your phone that way, that's you know, that's great. I use it sometimes to take the photos. Um, it, I just happen to be, uh, I think one of the differences is that I take a lot of photos and, and, uh, and so I, ha <laughs> I, I have, yeah, I have to bulk up load because, I, um, because I, I just take so many, but, but if you just see a random Isabella tiger moth, woolly bear walking across the trail in front of you, you know, and you're out doing other things, you could you just use your phone, go through the app if you want, upload it, and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want me to read the, the chat? Oh, uh, actually, no, I can, uh, now I can see it. So uh, there's one from Nikki. Okay. Um, why don't you start me off and then I'll try to okay. catch up with you. Okay. I've joined projects in the past 
but have seen that others pull my observations without joining? Does it depend on how the project is set up? Uh, uh, let me find it again. Sorry, I, I was scrolling at the same time as I was listening. Do you, can you read it to me one more time, please? Sure. So Nikki says, I've joined projects in the past, but have seen that others pull my observations without joining. Yes, I got it. Um, yes, it does depend on how the project is set up, Nikki. So some projects require that you join them. You actually have to click a button at the top right hand side. This is join. Okay. Others are called collection projects and you don't have to join them and it will grab your photo whether you even knew the project existed or not. Okay. I personally am not a big fan of the ones that make people join. I need, would need to see a really good reason why you would require that because it excludes a lot of observations. But sometimes there are good reasons for it. If, it, if it's a, a contest with a bio blitz, for example, and you need to join to win a prize. Um, but otherwise, your photos will end up showing up in all kinds of projects that you may not have even known existed. And that's kind of cool um, because they are collection projects. So if, it, if you took a photo of a... Um, of a uh, seabird, there might be some project called Seabirds of the Pacific Northwest, and it'll grab that seabird even though you didn't know the project existed. Does that does that help? Okay. Any um. Yeah. Any other questions? John, I, I just want to make a comment on on integration because because I, I I kind of agree that sometimes there's just too many places to put your observations, your photos, mm -hmm. or your wave files. But it's my understanding that the Europeans have started to initiate some form of a integration service, something called GBIF or something, yep. uh, where they're they're working collectively to try to figure out how to rationalize and and sort of all the data di different data formats that exist in, in all these different things uh, and bring them together. And uh, I don't know if much of that is happening in Canada. Uh, it would be nice because it would be nice as people trying to support community science or citizen science, they don't have to worry about where to put stuff. Uh, they can just mm -hmm. let the professionals tie it all together for anyone who wants to integrate the data across different databases. But it seems to be happening in certain places in the world, but I, I haven't heard about it here. Well, it, it is happening here. So GBIF stands for Global Biodiversity Information um, Facility, GBIF. And yeah. um, it's actually, I believe it's actually administered by a branch of the United Nations. And all, all of the uh, data, well, nearly all of the data, depending on research quality, from both eBird and iNaturalist go to GBIF. They're already doing okay. it. So uh, I think about once a year, both platforms dump all their data into GBIF. And then anybody can go to there as, as a central clearinghouse. I think of it, it's the mothership of community science and, and a lot of other databases too, like thousands of them. And you can search there. So if a researcher wants the data on, you know, to understand the, um, you know, the distributions of snow geese and uh you know in in uh western north america they could go to gbif and get that information so it's already happening that is actually um and ebird and iNaturalist are both i think the the two i don't remember which is higher than the other the two biggest um uh, contributors to to gbif so as as a so as, as a hobbyist you don't folks you don't need to know about this i mean this is just this is nerdy stuff if you're a researcher researchers do know about gbif and and they do they do use it um i've been on there a number of times from some of my own work okay yep. interesting yeah and anybody can unload the data you can download the data for free from ebird or inaturalist ebird doesn't charge for its service um, and uh, in my opinion, both are providing are giving back to us um, a lot more than we're giving them. Because if you want to keep track of your bird checklists, there's nothing better than eBird. And if you want to keep track of all your photos of anything else and observations, in my opinion, there's not much better than iNaturalist. So we get a lot from them, but it's um, and and they're not charging 
people for their services. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting point because I, I've looked at my own life list, if, so to speak, if that's what I call it, in iNaturalist. Um, and actually, I was kind of surprised because it reminded me of what, a whole bunch of stuff that I'd seen that I had forgotten all about. But it, you're right, it's pretty cool because you can go in there and have iNaturalist tell you and categorize all of the various taxonomic groupings, you know, what you saw. And uh, yeah, yeah that, that's pretty cool. I, mm -hmm. I, I do that once in a while. Come on, admit it. You do it more than once a while. <laughs> I don't want to sound too nerdy. <laughs> I actually find all of this stuff really fun. It really is. It's so cool. <laughs> and if it helps people like you and others, hey, bonus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's kind of my attitude. Bonus. It, it, it needs to be fun. It needs to be fun for the people that are using it. And if it's not fun then uh, either you're doing it wrong or, or it's just not for you. Um, but, but I, I, you know, as a scientist, as a research scientist, I, I can get a lot more bang for my buck doing my, in my day job scientifically, but this is my hobby and playing with photos is a hobby. And so I naturalist and eBird are sort of integral parts of my overall hobby as, as a, as a keen naturalist, they're part of my hobby. So it comes under the category of hobby, not burden. But I, but that's not for everybody. And I, so I don't, you know, I'm not trying to shame anybody into using community science. It has to work for you. And so Harvey Thank put you. an example of what he has done in iNaturalist as a, as a link to say that people have been giving him great responses. So there is a question from Peter. He, ha he asked, do you ever do tours with the public? You're so knowledge knowledgeable. It would be great. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Um, yep. Um, I certainly have. I'm, um, those were my roots. I, I grew up in Ontario and I was a naturalist in Algonquin Park for five summers. So that's kind of helped to solidify some of my um, current natural history obsession. I believe you said you're at Bella Bella. Um, I work out of Bella Bella. Yes. I have a permanent base there in Helsic territory. Okay. That's where oh. I work. Um, and, uh, it, yeah, on the central coast. So. We live on an island and we spend our days boating around to salmon streams and looking at ecosystems that way. So if you actually do publicly, publicly make your make your tours pub publicly available, my God, how do we find out about it? Oh, I haven't even thought about it yet. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we could we can talk about that, whether there's a, a but I, I like I don't lead I don't lead tours professionally or anything. I just do nature walks sometimes. That but I haven't, I haven't planned event. on any right now, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I might be persuaded sometime. I certainly love sharing my love of natural history with other people, as I suspect you can tell. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So lots of um, appreciation in the text. <clears throat> want to read those yeah thank you for yes i am seeing those thanks very much everybody i won't respond in the in the chat but i do appreciate the uh the comments there john i have one question i took a photo i was with my daughter at, at uh, minicata park in july and she she saw this plant called the ghost what's called the ghost pipe yeah and I, i've got it on my phone here yeah um but i didn't take it in in I didn't take it in uh, iNaturalist at the time. I just took a picture with, with my phone. So I've got it stored in my photos, but I was just looking to see if there was a way that I could automatically transfer the picture from my cell phone um, album into iNaturalist, but I can't seem to find a way when I choose the picture on my cell phone here, which is a pretty good picture, I can't find a way to automatically transfer it into iNat. Do you know, is, is there a way to do that? Or? Yeah, well, the, the idiot's way to do it is to, to um, put it on. <laughs> well, it's the way I <laughs> think of. I don't mean you. It's my way of doing That's it. That's okay. It's apt here. <laughs> All right. Well, my, my idiot's way would be, I would be, um, I'd be airdropping it to my laptop or I'd put it on my laptop and then I'd put it on iNaturalist using the laptop. Oh, okay. That's what I would do. But... Um, you know, a teenager would would probably find a way to do it from within the iNaturalist app on your phone. And I can't tell you how to do that because I haven't tried it, but I'm pretty sure that I think I, I, I know how to do that. that. I, 
All right. If you go to, if you, yeah. so I'm looking at it now. If you go to, um, so you go to observe, observe and then photo and library. And yeah, there it is. Yeah. That works. So you go to yeah. your app, yeah. observe yeah. photo library, and it shows you all the photos uh, from your photo yeah. library. And then you select it and it'll send it up from within your, your phone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll look at that later. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. You bet. Okay. I won't take up your time. No, I've just learned something too. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> No, and thank you very much. It was it was really nice of you to take your time to explain it because it was a little confusing, um, especially in the beginning when I was first trying to figure out how to, how to use it. And you've you've really covered it really well, John. And I really appreciate your time on behalf of Nature Vancouver for uh, being with us tonight and uh, being so good about uh, explaining it and answering our questions. So thank you very very much. Muchly appreciated. Well, my my pleasure. And I, I love I love doing things like this, and I appreciate the invitation. your question later back to your family john and um and uh, stay safe hope the rest of the year goes well for you you bet okay thanks everybody Thank you for <laughs> okay. very much i learned right. a lot too okay good night